43 and a half years? I don't think there's any half. 43 straight, right? For many people, just the thought of going to prison means certain death. They'd rather die than find themselves in that predicament. Some would even opt to take their life than spend even a second in a penitentiary. So, what's really going on? Where is this fear coming from? And is it based on reality or a twisted understanding of the prison system? An understanding twisted by countless Hollywood movies and hit tracks? I guess what I am asking is this. What are the chances that the first 24 hours of a new inmate won't become his last? Well, let's find out. The sentencing process. Would you rather be judged by the jury of your peers or a jury of people trained in the legal system? In my opinion, juries can be too easily confused and deceived and manipulated. Being trained doesn't make one wise or honorable. I know plenty of trained people in the legal system who nevertheless don't apply the law correctly. Before you go to prison, you have to be sentenced. And before you are sentenced, you have to be tried by a jury of your peers. This process, your trial, is what determines your fate. If you are found guilty by that jury, you will be given a sentence that, in most cases, implies jail time. Depending on the severity of your crime, it could be a few months, a year, or a couple of decades. You could even be on death row. After your sentencing, there are two scenarios that would determine just how prepared you are for prison. Hi, I'm Corrections Deputy Rachel Smith, and I've been with Pierce County Sheriff's Department since March of 2021. Let me give you a tour of the jail. So this is uh, one of the units in the new jail. It's called Two Charlie. We currently have a little over 80 inmates being able to be housed in this unit. The first scenario could see you having already spent some time in a county jail like the one I just showed you because you were held without bond. If this is your predicament, then it means you already have a strong feeling for the system. And as shocking as this might sound, it is probably the best because you will not be shocked by what you find in the prison system, at least not in the first 24 hours of your stay. You must know that prisons are not county jails. While one is a facility created for the sole purpose of holding convicted criminals for extended periods, the other was created for short stays to hold arrested persons who might or might not go to prisons. But that doesn't make county jails any better or more appealing. Most people will tell you, especially convicted prisoners who have spent actual time, that county jails are worse than prisons. A New York Times article by a convict who had spent two decades in the prison system revealed that lengthy incarceration time did not prepare him for the two weeks he spent in a county jail. He spoke about how overcrowded the jails were, how expensive the food was, and how that expensive food tasted like ground-up gym mat with some little seasoning. The truth is, if you have a high chance of ending up in a prison system for a long time and you want to toughen yourself before you get in, you might want to reconsider bailing yourself out. Consider it boot camp for this new phase of your life. Okay, so you've been sentenced and your fate is sealed. You got your time for the crime and now it's time to do it. Well, at this point, you are now in the custody of the state or the federal system. You are now the responsibility of the Bureau of Prisons. So what's the next step? Well, now is the time for something called classification. Right now, there's about 7,000 inmates in a maximum security prison in the state of South Carolina, and this reclassification could reduce that number by 4,000 inmates. Classification means exactly what it sounds like, and it goes farther than just reallocating prisoners from one risk level to another. That allocation applies to every prisoner, especially the new ones. In simpler terms, if you're a cold-blooded killer, you'd be sent to a maximum security facility to meet your peers. But if you were, say, a first-time offender with no prior criminal record, you would be sent to a medium security facility or even a low security facility. And if you're a gang member, this process is also used to ensure that you aren't sent to the wrong facility. For example, if you belong to the southern prison gang, Sureno, the classification process would ensure you aren't sent to a prison run by your rivals, the northern prison gang, Nortenos, because that's basically a death sentence for you. There have been people who died during this process because of one error or another made during the classification process. It's government run. And you know how government run systems can be, there's enough room for errors. So, if you thought your first 24 hours were going to be terrifying, know that the terror begins before the clock even begins to tick. 
Nick, hours before you are even in the system. Now, in the US, there are two ways this classification process can happen, the state process or the federal process. Now, if your sentence falls under state jurisdiction, you will be sent to a county jail. Remember, this is after your sentencing and not before, so there's no bond here. You're basically on the stairway to incarceration. Now, if it is federal, you'd be sent to a detention center that will function as a holding cell prior to your transport to the federal prison the system chooses for you. And their detention centers aren't any better than county jails either. The one you're looking at right now is MCC New York, and the footage is from March 2023. Now, this process can be tedious and incredibly long. For some, and if there are complications, you can spend up to a week or more before transport. In the best case scenario, it will take just a couple of days. But when the moment of truth arrives and your classification process is concluded, you and a couple of other prospective inmates will be filed onto a bus or van or even a plane depending on where your prison is and how high your risk level is. It's going to be a long ride to hell from here on out. The first 12 hours. Timothy Chappelle was being transported from the North Jail to the downtown Central Jail facility when he kicked the passenger side window and broke the barricade. The likelihood of this happening to you is incredibly low, especially if this is your first time en route to jail. So manage your expectations. You'll still hear the occasional escape, but it is very unlikely, especially in a first world country. Now, instead of plotting an escape that'll never happen, you should use your van ride to prison as an opportunity to make friends, forge alliances, or familiarize yourself with the system you're about to plunge into head first. The one thing you don't want to do is stand out to the guards. You also don't want to annoy any future inmate because they will not forget, and God help you that they aren't violent. If you make friends, good for you. If you don't, there's no loss. You have your whole sentence to forge allies. By this time, you should have arrived at your prison gate. Now it is time for the next phase. You are ordered to disembark the transport van as prison guards begin to usher you into the facility. Now, movies often portray prison guards armed with guns escorting would-be prisoners into the facility. Let me make this clear. Prison guards do not carry guns. Guns are not even allowed on prison premises for obvious reasons, except under extreme circumstances. As you and your new colleagues get escorted onto prison premises, you will be met and escorted by unarmed guards. Now you might be wondering, but what's stopping me from trying to escape or something? Well, the answer to that would be to look up. There are guns in the prison towers, so anyone outside acting funny might become the tragic punchline of a very organic joke. But on the prison's outer perimeter, it functions as an external line of defense. Within the prison, the only guns that exist are kept in the armory, and they are used in the extreme case of a prison riot. Moreover, you'd all be in chains, and you'd all be moving, so there's not enough time to start any trouble. And even if you did, there's enough guards who'd been trained to squash the exact scenario you're attempting. From the bus, you'd be escorted through the prison facility, not to your prison cells, but to another holding unit within the facility, where you will undergo yet another tedious process called R and D, receiving and discharge. This is where your mugshot will be taken, your detail typed in, cross-checked, and your fingerprints scanned electronically and received into the prison's database. When all of this is done and finished, you will be given a prison ID card with your picture, name, height, weight, and serial number. In some prisons, you will be required to have that ID card on you at all times. In some others, all you need to know is your serial number. After this is the next, more eventful part of R and Amp D, and it is the inspection and cavity search. A group of officers will line you up along. You might or might not be patted down. Then, you'd be ordered to strip your clothes. In most cases, these guards won't touch your body whether or not they have a glove on, but they will check your eyes and nostrils and ears. You will definitely be ordered to open your mouth and lift your tongue as they shine a torch to search for contrabands. Then they'll move down to your nether regions where you'd be asked to lift your privates as they check them thoroughly, or as thoroughly as one can do with a flashlight. Then you'd be ordered to turn, bend, and spread your ass cheeks as they shine that same torch down your hole looking for contrabands. If you're a pro at something called suitcasing, they won't find anything. It's not like they are excited to look at tens to hundreds of buttholes daily. And if you're new to the system, you won't be thinking of hiding anything there. So don't get excited. And no, there will be no shoving of hands into your hole. So don't look forward to it. Again, in most cases, no guard will poke his hands into any hole. But you will lose your dignity. After this, you will be given the standard issue clothing that's a bright orange in the US. Might be a jumpsuit, might be a two-piece. There's a unique kind of joy in finding out for yourself. Then you'd be taken to a medical examiner whose job 
job is to check you and determine that you are in decent health. Then, a psychological examination will also be conducted. Do not expect anything thorough. At this point, it might all be a formality. No one's gonna say, hey, we just figured he is mentally unstable for prison. Let's reconsider. Everybody's mentally unstable for prison. It is prison. You're still gonna get into that prison cell. Now, if you think the guards will prepare you for what's to come during this process, if you are expecting some form of orientation to get you ready for the actual prison experience, then I hate to disappoint you because none of that is going to happen. It's not that the guards hate you, they just don't care. It is not part of the process. You are a big boy, a big girl. You'll figure things out. Moreover, that's the job of someone else entirely that we'll mention as we progress. If you're lucky and you made friends on the bus who have been through the prison system, they'll prep you for what's to come. If you're unlucky and haven't made any friends, then keep your fingers crossed because you're in for quite the ride. Now, by this time, you've probably gone almost 24 hours without food. More than half that time was spent through one documentation process or the other, and now you're 12 hours into your first 24 hours in prison, drowsy, hungry, and thirsty, while also struggling to stay sharp and alert. A guard is going to shove supplies in your hands as you embark on your way to your cell. Now, your time has started to count. All of what you just went through was not even the prison itself. It was just a preamble of what's to come. With your sheets, toothpaste, pillowcase, shoes, and towel in hand, you head toward your prison cell, most likely bewildered. In some prisons, you are allowed to find a prison for yourself. This is usually in mid- and low-level security prisons across states, and it helps racial clusters, religious clusters, and even gang clusters. You might find a good roommate quicker this way. But in most of the other prisons, especially Federal Max, you will be assigned to a prison block and cell. It gets even tougher from here on out. May the patron saint of testosterone and adrenaline be on your side because you're gonna need all of her for what's to come the other 12 hours. Congratulations. It's official now. You are in, a bona fide inmate. There's no doubt about your criminal status. Like I said earlier, in a medium security prison or low security prison, you'd be given a prison cell and block right off the bat. But in maximum security prisons, you're moved to something called the SHU. Basically, it stands for Special Holding Unit, where high-risk inmates are moved to for consideration by the captain of the prison. Now, if you think this is something that'll take a few minutes or so, think again. It could take as long as two days or until the captain feels it's time to see you. And if you've not asked what the SHU looks like, well, you should. These are super max level conditions, but it is no better across federal maximum conditions. It is basically a single man holding cell where you stay in for 23 hours a day with only one hour of recreation. It is hell. But let's imagine you do not have to be sent to the shoe. Let's imagine you are either in low, medium, or an unproblematic max. Now is the time for the guard to escort you to your prison cell. Now, if you're expecting to be catcalled, intimidated, or screamed at by prisoners who see you as fresh blood, lower your expectations. No one is really going to waste their time on that. There are chances that it could happen, but those chances are low. And the reason why they are low is that you'd be going to your prison cell most likely during count. Count is prison lingo, for when prison guards literally stop everything happening in a prison and do a routine head count of everyone on prison premises and in custody. Now, count times in prison are not a precise science, especially from a convict's point of view. Sure, they start at the same times each day, 5 a.m., 11.30 a.m., 4 p.m., 9 p.m., and midnight. But when each one might end is anybody's guess. So, it's basically a slow-burning hell. However, whatever you are doing, even if you are in R&D taking a mugshot, you will have to stop and get counted. So, luckily for you, everyone everywhere will be too engaged to notice you as you quietly and dreadfully walk to what is about to be your home for the next few years, if you're lucky, or few decades if you're especially lucky. That's the window. Those lines up here, that's connected to the vents, you know, it's kind of rigged. That's where we hang our clothes at. Those are our shower bags, what we put, um, our shower stuff in when they let us out for shower. This is glamour, and you won't get this kind of glamour until you've spent some time in the system. If you are lucky, you have been paired with an inmate that wants no mischief and might actually become your friend. If not, then, well, sorry, that's all I can say. You will learn to love them. They will definitely ask you who you are affiliated to or with, and if the classification process was done correctly, you should have zero issues at this point. But, let's say your inmate is the quintessential nice guy, then your prison stay is about to get Get a little easier than the next guy because they'd be giving you much needed survival tips. But before all that, you'll take one long look at your one bedroom contained shared apartment. It's small, 48 SQFT, your bed space in the corner, the bottom, your toilet is staring right at you. This is now your life. But before you can even properly process your predicament, your stomach rumbles. You are beyond hungry. If your roommate was edible, you'd eat him whole. And I'm not kidding. Now it is time for lunch. And I know that you aren't expecting special meals or special 
treatments because the food is and will be crap. If it's morning, you'll be eating a breakfast of cereal, hot or cold, and milk. For lunch and dinner, you'll find variety in the crap they give you. Chicken, hamburgers, hot dogs, lasagna, burritos, tacos, or fish patties. And it's going to be one hell of a fish patty if you ask me. But the food is not the real problem here. Although in America, most prison meals are cooked and served by the prisoners themselves, which can lead to some tense prison politics. What you have to deal with is where you will have your meal. Because if you didn't know, that could be a life or death decision. There have been true life accounts of people who were stabbed to death for sitting on the wrong table. So, if you don't have a roommate that will carry you along to where you can eat in peace, you have to stand and watch, recognize the hierarchy, read people, identify clicks, spot the danger zones, and find a table that's neutral where you can sit and eat in peace. In prison, the best soft skills you can have is communication and a firm understanding of human psychology. Now, is there a chance someone will approach you while you are having your meal to start trouble? There is, but it is incredibly small. You see, in those first 24 hours, no one knows who you are, so no one is going out of their way to trouble you except you are in their way or you represent a gang that's a rival and word has gone round which, again, is unlikely. After your meal comes yard time. At this point, you couldn't be more glad. Movies paint yard time as this dreadful part of a prison experience of newbies where everything that can go wrong will go wrong. And while there might be some truth to it, it is not always the case. In fact, it is hardly ever the case. The truth is, if you know people, you'll be fine. And even if you didn't, you'd still most likely be fine. The chances are high you will, and it's not like you'd really care. At this point, you've been moving from one cell-like structure to the other for the past 18 hours. The only time you weren't in a cell, you were in a moving bus, in chains. If you are claustrophobic like me, you're probably sick to your stomach at this point and would kill for open skies above your head. Well, yard time is your chance for that. But let's imagine you have a reason to fear for your life, or you're probably just shy. Then you can choose to go for yard time during lunch. Rush your lunch, and while everyone is still dredging through their meal, head to the yard that would most likely be empty. If you want to exercise, exercise. If you want to laze around under the sun, do so. Just know that you have to head back to your cell before everyone else comes to the yard, because they will come en masse. And if you get caught wading against the current of criminals, you will stick out like a sore thumb. Worse, you could become an easy target for a stabbing. And you know what's even worse? The guards would most likely not see your body until you've bled out. Now it is shower time. Some prisons will have single cell showers, others might have multiple shower heads in a communal store. Whatever it is, you will want to wash up. Once again, just like yard time, you really have nothing to fear. Trust me, you can drop your soap and not fear picking it up. If you choose not to pick it up, it should be because of hygiene and not because you fear someone is going to take you from behind. In fact, the shower is going to be one of the few times you have privacy depending on how it is built. And showers generally make you feel good. It feels good to feel clean. With the shower out of the way, you head back to your cell, feeling brand new when your stomach begins to turn and swirl, this is the last hurdle you have crossed to make your 24 hours complete. Your cell is the impact zone of whatever dookie you're dropping in the loo, and only God knows how badly that prison meal is gonna smell as you let it all out down the toilet. Well, you should know that your roomie understands, and he's survived much longer with other inmates, so he'll have tips for you right off the bat. First things first, let them know you want to use the toilet. If they can, they'll step out to allow you do your thing. That's the best case scenario. If you're both locked in, and it's late at night, he'll turn away from you, face the wall so that the smell doesn't kill him. Now, most, if not all of prison toilets, work by suction. They don't use water to flush. Your dump is sucked away the moment you flush. This means you can and should do something called the courtesy flush. Immediately, you let one down. Flush immediately. Do it again for every poop comes down from your hole into that toilet. It reduces the smell, and is also a sign you respect your roomie. He'd do the same for you. Well, what do you know? You've done it. You probably talked to your roomie some hours after lights out. Then he crashed into sleep, leaving you with your own thoughts. People will tell you that every day in jail is the same. I wish it was true. While the routine is predictable, the humans in it are not. And if you're the rough type, you'll find out quickly enough. And even if you aren't, you should try your best to keep your head up, stay sharp, and always look out for yourself while watching over your shoulders. In the days to come, you'll learn about the commissary and the insanely expensive economics of it all. You'll be given access to a phone to call a select number of loved ones. You'll make friends, enemies, and get into it with some nasty guards. But you will be fine. You have to believe that. Well, that's all for now. Good night, inmate.